special blessing upon them that as they go through the days and, and years and life, as they re raise children, as they take care of the home, as they may be ones working to also help support the family. Lord, in all that they do, Father, we pray that you would bless them, that you give them favor, that you give them strength, and that you give them wisdom. And Lord, during times that just feel like it's insurmountable, it's tough, it's burdensome, they don't know what to do. Father, I pray that even as they turn to you, as they look to you, even with a sigh, that Lord, you hear that prayer. Father, bless each one in the days to come. That they would be the best mothers you created them to be. And that, Lord, truly they would be a blessing for generations to come. We thank you, Lord, for each mother here. We honor them and we praise you for them. Thank you for bringing them into our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name and all the people said, Amen. Amen. Bless you, mothers. You can be seated. When you saw that video, anything stand out to you? I love the last line, or last couple of lines. It says, faith or mentorship, adoption or by birth. There is a full spectrum of the way that one could be called a mom. Now, obviously, I, I'm not, I can't be a mom. I, don't, I can't experience what you guys are experiencing. But I can see. And what a blessing it is. And then it says that you play such an important role in the stories of generations to come. And as I started to just even think about that one line, that one verse, um, it's this idea that we're able to impact generations to come. And what a beautiful role that you have to impact generations. I'm not sure what it is about this, that word generations, but think about it. From your children's children's, your children's children's, and it can keep going. And that's such a beautiful thing. And God created you mothers to, to be able to pass down what you know about the Lord and, and, and all the things that you can teach your child to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. And what an honor that is. In that video, you saw a list of, of mothers, right? From the Old Testament right up to Mary. And um, they were all mothers that you would say did some great things. Right? Would you agree? They did things that were, where they were sacrificing, where they um, did the impossible. Sometimes you put yourself in that in their shoes. Would you be able to make the same same call? I don't know. Right? But something to think about. But they did great things. Eve, Sarah, Leah, Jochebed, Naomi, Mary. But it got me thinking. Wait a second. As much as that video is good and, and, and we agree that they've done great things, in our minds we see, yeah, we, of course we're going to list them out because of what we've seen them do. But it reminded me of a list of other mothers in the Bible. Ones that may have, some may have had a, a shady past. Some may have been in, a, in situations that were just not normal. Do you know where I'm going with this? If you look in Matthew chapter 1, there is a genealogy. Don't you love genealogies? Do you read through every name? Be honest. Sometimes. Sometimes we skip over it. But as I look through the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, it starts from Abraham and goes all the way down to Jesus, there are five mothers listed there. Five mothers. And as I started to just think about it, look through it, the first one um, is Tamar. Judah Bak ba Bagad, Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. Tamar was this mother in the Bible who, um, yep, gave birth for, uh, to Judah's sons that would continue the lineage of the line of Judah. But it was, she was one of the ones that had a shady background. She was married to his uh, previous sons, and they, they were killed off. She was supposed to be passed down to the third, but it never happened. And so she was waiting, waiting to be married, waiting to provide a family. But it was impossible. 
they kind of kept her in this limbo world because, well, he was afraid that his third son would actually die too. And so what did she do? Long story short, she pretends to be a prostitute and sleeps with her father-in-law. Oh, that sounds a little weird, right? When we're looking at it? Oh yeah, it, it totally does. Okay, keep that in mind. Then you have the next two. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Who's Rahab? Again, another one with a shady background, in a sense. She was the prostitute who then hid the two spies in Jericho from the, of the Israelites. And because she, you know, I remember seeing the line, she saw what God did. They heard about what God was doing amongst the Israelites, and they were in fear. But she realized who the real God was. And so she believed, and they, she hid these two spies, which enabled them to then take over Jericho, right? Then the next one is Boaz begot Obed by the mother, Ruth. We, we heard in the video about a, a mother named Naomi, and then that daughter that was there kind of bending, saying, hey, I will follow you. Your God will be my God. This is Ruth. Based on the law, she was disqualified because of her race. And because of that, she had, she had nowhere to go. She already lost her husband, but she said, no, Naomi, I'm going to make your God my God. I want to follow after you. She believed in God. Okay, so that's three, right? Number four, David the king begot uh, Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. They don't name the name there, but you know the story. And if you do, that means her name is Bathsheba. Now, mind you, she didn't technically do anything wrong. She was, in a sense, taken advantage of, if you could put it that way. But at the same time, the situation itself was not uh, uh, great, right? But she was listed here. And then the fifth one, we all know this, Mary, the mother of Jesus. She did nothing wrong, right? She, she, she's great, she's perfect, yep, I agree. But the situation, do you remember what we talked about during Christmas time if you were here? We looked at Mary and we saw that even though right away she said, yes, be it unto me, Lord, as you have said, she took an account about the situation that she was gonna be in. That she was engaged, in a sense married for a long engagement to Joseph and all of a sudden, she becomes pregnant. That's not his son. So that's another precarious situation, right? Okay, why am I bringing about this? Why am, I, why am I talking about all of this on Mother's Day? These ladies listed in the genealogy of Jesus. When you think about a genealogy, when you think about your lineage of someone like Jesus, his, the king, you'd expect that his line is perfect. That there is no questions, uh, questionable people, questionable characters uh, um, that would pos possibly pose problems. I feel like when we look into higher leadership in our, in our governments and whatnot, and whatnot, they do the digging to see what's in your past and what could be brought up. They look at all of it. But yet, in the video we see these moms who've done great things, but yet God put in Jesus' own line these five some of whom were disqualified, some of whom were not proper, not perfect. They didn't do that great things per se. But what does that mean for us? And this is not just for mothers. This is, guys, this is where you also come in, okay? What does that mean? They're not perfect, they're disqualified. Hey, does that sound like a lot of us? I hope so, because we're not perfect. The things that we do disqualify us, but yet, in essence, just as God put them in Jesus' genealogy, in the same manner, we are accepted and loved by Jesus because of what he did. You pay attention to the songs that we sang? Come as you are with all your flaws, with all your imperfections. This is a God of grace who loves you and is willing to say, to welcome you with open arms. No matter what you do, no matter how far you run away, he's still there. 
It kind of brings that story of the prodigal son, yeah? This is the joy of Jesus. And he put these ladies in, in the line, and I believe that's to show us that. As I was thinking through this, so then, why does that all matter? Why does it matter that we're a part of Jesus' family? That it doesn't matter about our past or what we've done or what we will do. Let me get to that. Proverbs 13, 22 says, A good person leaves an inheritance to their children's children. Sure, think about the context. It's all about money, right? You're leaving a physical, financial inheritance to your children's children. That's a double generation, yeah? But in our context of what we're talking about today, it's not just about the finances here. We're talking about a legacy, what did you say, to, uh, Lou? A legacy of faith for the generations. That's why we're celebrating moms, because you got so much to do, uh, um, and it's, so, it's such an awesome privilege and role that you have to, to raise children, that they would then teach their children about the Lord. But what's so important by leaving them an inheritance? A faith inheritance. It's this. When they grow up, your children, who will then teach their children's children, you can be the ones who affect change in your family line. You may be the first generation of believers, but that goes all the way down for years and generations to come. You, are, you have the opportunity to teach them that Jesus is the one who provides, that Jesus is the one who gives them wisdom in times of need and trouble. He's the one who takes care of everything. But how do you leave that inheritance? You live it out. You show it. I don't know what situation you're facing right now. It may not be, a, a, it might be a crazy one, it might not be. But what I'm learning, oh my daughter's not here, what I'm learning, they watch. They watch and hear everything. They are sponges soaking in everything. So think about that. What inheritance of faith am I leaving for my children's children? Through the tough times, do I just start scrounging and, and look to myself to make ends meet, to get through life? Or am I truly doing what I'm teaching? I'm going to Him. I think you've heard me say this time and time again over the years. Our first response to a problem is not this way to someone, my best friend, or even my spouse. It, well, that's part of it. <laughs> it's part of it. <laughs> but it should be this way. First and foremost, absolutely, it should be this way. You and God. And we go from there, right? As I listened, uh, as I looked to this verse, then all of a sudden God flashed this verse across my mind. Paul is writing in 2 Timothy, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, he's talking about Timothy now, the faith that I see in you, Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. See the generation for children's children? Lois brought it down, gave it to Eunice, and Eunice then taught Timothy. And here, Paul sees it. He sees the faith that's in him, and he's telling him, the verse after this is, hey, fan into a flame that gift that was laid on you. Some people have different interpretations of that, but it's the gifting on the inside, and let's just say, hey, the power of God, the Holy Spirit inside of you. Let's roll that out. Why does this all matter? Why does it matter about you passing down from generation to generation? Because the world needs to see who Jesus is. And it starts with you moms. What a great responsibility and role that is. And it's amazing to see as you see generations to come and as they start worshiping and going out there to make a huge difference. So the point that I want to leave you with is leave a legacy of faith. 
That word legacy doesn't just sound good when it rolls off your tongue. Leave a legacy. And it's not too late. It's never too late. And don't worry if you think, well, I haven't done a good job. Hey, don't let that disqualify you. Jesus already taken care of that. Amen? You keep moving forward and, and letting your children see who Jesus is in action. Since we're talking about this, just this week, uh, anyone been to the firehouse sub? Firehouse subs in town? Brand new little sub house? Pretty good. It's not an official plug, it's just a great place to have a meeting. Met with another pastor there, and we started talking about declaring God's goodness. That, that's such a simple way to just start by leaving this legacy. Where you see God working, declare it. What do I mean by that? Uh, we were talking about someone that was healed of, of these tension headaches. And all of a sudden, it got to a point where he called this person out and said, well, yeah, you know, you did this, this, and this, and that's why it's all done. Fair, that, that's all science. Science was teaching you how to do this, or why it happened, in a sense. Right? There's a need in, in ourselves to know how, how things operate, why they operate, why things happen. But then he, he mentioned this. Regardless of how it happened, where does the healing come from? It comes from Jesus. So let's declare that. And they realize, wait a second, I just reasoned God out of the whole situation. Maybe, maybe you've done that. I've done that too. But it's reminding ourselves, let's declare what God does and let people see. Let alone, forget about just doing it for your kids. Can we do that as a church? As you hear about what God does, faith springs forth because you're hearing about his goodness. Amen? That's a little tidbit for you. But now, we're going to move into a time of communion. Think about it. Jesus himself came. He had this awesome genealogy, a listing of people. But yet he came for one purpose. And what was that? To go on that cross, to take all of our sin, our shame, our judgment, our punishment into his own body. So that when he says, my God, why have you forsaken me? We then, by the opposite, can say, my God, why have you so blessed me? Why can we call God our Father? Because he opened up a new way where we can come to him just as we are. Amen? So this is, the, this is the God that we have, the God who loves us. And this is how they did it. They would have feasts to commemorate what God did. And they passed that down from generation to generation. So when we partake in communion, folks, it's not just something we do once a month. It's not just a ritual for the sake of having one. We're doing it because we are remembering tangibly the grace that Jesus has given. We all need more of his grace. Right? Amen? And so as we partake in this moment, remember the goodness, the legacy that Jesus has left us that we are to perpetuate. We're remembering his goodness. Amen? 